Good morning, everyone. My name is Megan White, and I'm the Deputy Director of Programs at the New York State Council on the Arts. Welcome to our FY 2024 Support for Organizations webinar. We are so excited to be joined today by hundreds of attendees from across all 10 regions of New York State. We're also immensely grateful for the recognition our sector, as is reflected in Governor Hochul and the New York State Legislature's investment of $127 million for the arts in FY 2024. This was a team effort. On behalf of NISCA, we thank all of you for your work in reaching your legislators and local media regarding arts funding. NISCA launched our FY 2024 guidelines and application manual on May 16th. We highly encourage all applicants to read these guidelines thoroughly before reaching staff with questions and attending webinars and office hours. These materials can be found on the NISCA website under the For Applicants tab. Today's webinar will be an overview of our FY 2024 Support for Organizations grant opportunity. We'll cover topics such as eligibility, key dates, and the application process. Many thanks to those of you who submitted questions in advance. We will have a dedicated Q&A session following this presentation, and you can still submit questions through the Q&A Q feature at the bottom. We encourage you to listen to the entire presentation before submitting your questions today. We also have budgeted time to go a little bit over if we receive a lot of questions as your schedule allows. A reminder that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the NISCA website. We will share that link with you all when it's live. I'm now pleased to introduce NISCA program directors, Christine Leahy and David Huck, who will take us through this opportunity. Welcome, Christine and David. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here with you. All right, what is the first step to apply for NISCA funding? Pre-qualification. This might be the most important slide in the presentation. And if you come back to see more webinars, you're probably going to see it at least a few more times. Uh, you must be pre-qualified in the New York State Grants Gateway online portal in order to be eligible for funding through NISCA. This is a separate portal from the way you're, uh, you're submitting your application and is a requirement for any nonprofits to be receiving funding from New York State. Um, it does take a little bit of time. We recommend that you do that process as soon as possible. Slide. So for returning applicants, this is something that needs to happen every year. Uh, this is also something where uh, Every year, uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things to see every year is there is a handful of applications where people go all through all the trouble of filling out all the information, applying to the, for funding, but because they are not pre-qualified, they, they are not eligible to be considered for funding. This process can take up to a week. So please, please, please do not wait until the last day. And if you have questions about pre-qualifications, you can contact our help desk at help at arts.ny.gov. Here's some key dates. The guidelines have been posted now. Uh, and we're really excited that the application portal, the online portal, will open tomorrow. Uh, so you are ready to do this work as soon as, it, as you are ready. I do want to talk about the deadline, which is going to be July 13th at 4 p.m. This is a hard machine set deadline. At 401, we will not be able to accept new applications. So every year, just like about the pre-qualification, every year on deadline day, I receive a flurry of emails for people that have, you know, staff members that are out sick, they have computer problems, they're having trouble with their connectivity, and they're very stressed out that they're not going to make the 4 p.m. deadline. Don't let this be you. Please, please, please do not wait till the last day. Get this in with plenty of time to spare so that you don't run into that hard deadline at 4 p.m. All right, we're here to talk about support for organizations grant. Uh, this offers flexible funding for organizations. This is an organization grant. It is not project-based. So when we go over the, the questions in a moment, you'll see that all the questions are backwards looking. They're talking about the programming you've done in the past, your relationships with your community, uh, how you've set up your organization for staffing and governance. There is not, this is not a project, it is not a grant where you're talking about the projects you're going to do in the future. This funding is not project-based. 
So you can allocate the funding that you receive. You can allocate it to staff salaries. You can allocate it to paying your rent, keeping the lights on, those critical components to keep your organization running. There's not an opportunity for say, I would like to use this money to do a film festival to do something specific. You're talking about what you've done in the past and then you're allocating the funding where it's going to be most helpful in the coming year. Activities will be for the calendar year 2024, beginning January 1st to December 31st, 2024. Award amounts run between $10,000 and $49,500. And grants cannot represent more than 50% of an organization's operating expenses that were calculated in their most recently completed fiscal year. Uh, this last point is a change uh, from years past, uh, from, from last year, and it is a return to a pre-pandemic policy that NISCA has about uh, funding only a limited percentage of an organization's budget. Uh, before we move on, I also want to mention that organizations that receive multi-year funding uh, for fiscal year 2024 do not need to apply again this year. And if you are, uh, if you're unsure whether or not you received multi-year funding last year, go back to your uh, award letter, which was sent via email, which will tell you how many years of funding you received. So if you received one year last year, you will be applying again this year. If you have multi-year funding, you do not need to apply again. We will be sending contracting instructions for multi-years in June. All right. Organizations apply to this program in one of two ways. They apply directly or through a sponsor. Uh, to receive funds, either as a direct applicant or as a sponsor, you must meet these eligibility requirements. You must be a nonprofit organization incorporated in or registered to do business in New York State, and you must have a 501c3, or you can be a part of a state or federally recognized Native American nation or tribe, or a unit of local or federal government in New York State. Some applicants must apply as sponsored organizations. This is a list of who comes through the program in that way. This was for organizations that might be community-based or otherwise not yet incorporated, or uh, if you've not yet received it, your tax exempt under Internal Revenue Service 501c3, or if your organization exists as a semi-autonomous or distinct program within a parent organization. This would be like a theater within a university, university that has a fair degree of independence. So this means, You've got your own staff, you have your own identity within a website, your own programming. Uh, those sorts of activities would come in as a sponsored organization. The application questions are the same, uh, both for sponsored and, spon and direct applicants. Finally, organizations that, have, that are LLCs are not eligible uh, for funding uh, through NISCA. Uh, so if you have questions about that, you can reach out to our help desk. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, because the minimum uh, award is $10,000 and we can fund no more than 50% of an organization's annual budget, you must show that you have expenses of at least $20,000 in your most recently completed fiscal year. Uh, you're going to show that by uploading your profit and loss statement uh, within your budget documents that you apply, that you submit to this application. Uh, if you are under that threshold, if you are a small organization that, that is not able to show expenses of over $20,000, we recommend that you reach out to our regrant programs, which can, are available via that one. I also want to say that if you have questions about whether or not you should apply directly or through a sponsor, uh, I encourage you to attend our office hours for supporting organizations, uh, which will be held June 8th at 10 a.m. So this application process and scoring review process are guided by our agency's mission and values. And as a public agency, our mission is to foster and advance the full breadth of New York State's arts, culture, and creativity for all. What we value is the vast diversity of New York State communities, equitable engagement with the arts for people of all ages and inclusive of all backgrounds, access to the full breadth of arts and culture, the vital role that arts and culture play in the health of the economy and people, the constant evolution of art making and the creative practice, and creativity as a community asset. So in line with these, this mission and these values, we have articulated 
funding priorities that include a commitment to underrepresented communities. And our agency embraces the widest spectrum of cultural expression and artistic pluralism and encourages funded organizations to demonstrate a holistic and comprehensive commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. NISCA will prioritize funding to organizations that are within and serve historically underrepresented communities, although every arts and cultural organization is eligible for funding. And historically underrepresented communities include those that are listed on this slide, but are not limited to these. We're going to come back to these funding priorities when we get to the application narrative. So the first thing that you're going to see once you're inside the application is what we think of as the registration questions. And this is where we capture some basic info and statistics about your organization. Everything that's asked is up here on this slide. And I wanted to point out a couple of things that are new this year within the section. We are asking applicants to provide a link to their board from their website in this section. There's also going to be a box where you can annotate the most important things about that board list. We'd like to know, for example, just quick bios of the officers, uh, the length of their terms and total years of service. And please also disclose here if there are any relationships between board and staff, for example, if a board member is um, a family member of a staff member. Also new this year is that after the attendance figures, we ask for both in-person attendance and virtual attendance for the two um, most recent calendar years. There's a box where you can break down what that means for your organization. This is something we added in response to feedback. So for example, if you said you had um, 10,000 in-person audience members, you would break it down perhaps into this means we had 1,000 people attend a workshop and 9,000 people attend performances. Or if you put down 5,000 in virtual attendance, that could mean that you had 4,000 publication sales and 1,000 people attending a virtual reading. Also in this registration section, you're going to have a drop down menu for your organization type, which is the type of artistic artistic discipline that you primarily engage with. And the next section of the application will be where you select the panel, the discipline panel that you would like to review your proposal. So while our application is one-stop shopping, whether you are a museum or a literary organization, or an arts education organization, you're filling out the same proposal, but you will indicate what discipline panel you would like to review that proposal. The options are listed here. Uh, we understand that many organizations do more than one thing. You might be a theater that also has a, a school partnership program, for example, and panels understand that and are equipped um, to engage with these types of applicants. If you do have any questions about where you think you best fit, please reach out to a program staff person and we would be happy to talk through um, the options with you. And if at the time of the application, you still just really don't know where you would fit best, you can click, I don't know. All right. Um, after you select your panel, there's some questions around what type of organization you are. This will be a drop down list for you to select which best describes your organization. So your options are going to be a 501c3 nonprofit with arts and culture as the center of its mission, a 501c3 nonprofit that doesn't have arts and culture as the center of its mission, but that has a significant track record of arts programming. For example, uh, a theater program within a larger service organization. You can also indicate whether or not you are a uh, state or federally recognized Native American nation or unit of government, or a semi-autonomous arts organization housed within a large institution, like an art museum within a university, or an unincorporated arts group applying it through a fiscal sponsor. Based on your answers to these questions, you will be prompted to answer specific additional questions about your organization's governance and your relationship with your sponsoring organization, if appropriate, as well as an opportunity for sponsor organizations to provide detail about their audiences that might not have been captured within the earlier registration questions. But after that, 
all of the narrative questions are going to be identical uh, for all types of applicants. So the narrative sections are separated into three categories, creativity, public service, and management and financial. The first section is creativity. Here's an option for you to provide an overview of your programs of activities and highlight three recent examples of different activities that represent your organization's artistic and cultural vision. As Christine mentioned earlier, we recognize that organizations might have a plurality of different types of organizations. You might have theater and education and maybe a visual arts gallery. Uh, I really, you should be talking about the depth, the breadth of your organization's programming as opposed to say, thinking I'm applying for you know, I'm applying to the theater panel, so I should just talk about theater. This is an opportunity to talk about uh, holistically your organization's programming. Uh, this is also a, ch a chance for you to explain how you work with local and artistic communities to reflect their interests and needs. And I would recommend uh, that you connect your recent examples that you're listing within this narrative with your uploads, uh, your work sample, which we'll talk about in a moment. The second narrative question is around public service. So firstly, you'll be asked to identify, uh, going back to that list of underrepresented communities, what percentage of your total annual audience comes from historically underrepresented communities as an estimate. And then you will describe your audience uh, and identify which communities your organization serves. Managing and financial. All right, last but not least, the third narrative category is around my management and financial. So you already will have answered questions about board and governance within the registration questions, uh, but here's a chance for you to talk about staff. If your organization is primarily uh, staffed through volunteers or board members that are doing staff roles, please outline that here. You're basically talking about who runs the programs uh, within your organization. Then you'll have an opportunity to talk about challenges. This is especially a chance to specifically ad address deficits or other financial challenges that might be evident within your submitted financial statements. But you could also talk about other examples within the past five years about specific organization challenges and how your organization worked to overcome them. There's also an opportunity to talk about artist compensation. Uh, and in this section, uh, you will talk about if your organization works with artists, you can explain how they are compensated and the compensating structure used. Uh, and I encourage people to be specific here to talk about the specific ranges uh, of compensation that they're using uh, within their organization. Your organization's uh, tax documents, your 990s, are not part of this application. Uh, however, NISCA does review IRS information for eligibility. So if your organization shows persistent uh, negative net assets or negative revenues on their 990s, there's a chance for you, uh, an opportunity for you to explain them. If not, you do not need to fill out that section. Uh, and we might uh, follow up with organizations that do uh, have those negative net assets or negative revenues uh, to confirm that they're eligible for state funding. Uh, finally, uh, you'll be asked to enter the total expenses for your organization's most recently completed fiscal year. And as a reminder of this, this number must be at least $20,000 to be eligible for this category. Okay, so some tips on narrative questions. Some of the most common pieces of feedback that uh, panelists give are related to clarity. Uh, so when applications do not clearly address the application questions, they're difficult to score. So I really encourage you to go through, not just to look for uh, eloquence and, and making sure that you're telling your story, but really ask yourself, making sure that you are addressing each of the questions specifically. So uh, we're going to talk about the rubric in a moment, but um, I think one thing that's really special about this application is that the rubric that's included within the application is the exact same that we are giving to panelists. So you can review your own application or ask a friend to review it using the same rubric that our panelists use in order to, assert, um, in order to score your applications. There are strict character limits, uh, so you can uh, keep those in mind as you are 
uh, preparing responses. But again, I recommend to be concise and to the point and focusing on clarity. I'm gonna now turn it over back to Christine to talk about support materials. The next section of the application is where you upload things. Um, the first is three work samples. So these are three links to audio and or visual materials that hopefully refer back to what you discussed in that creativity section that David talked about. And it's great when these examples can illustrate the programming that you discussed. So this might be images from exhibitions. It might be an excerpt from a performance. It might be a link to a publication or a video from a workshop where you see teaching artists interacting with students. Um, it's important to label what we're looking at so that we know what we're seeing. And it's important to keep in mind that panelists are reviewing a lot of materials, so they're going to spend no more than about 10 minutes on this section. So if you are including, it's fine to include a link to, you know, an entire performance, but just please tell us what section, what timestamp we should start the review at, because you want to make sure that panelists are seeing exactly what you want them to see. Keep in mind that links have to be live through the end of the year. They can't be password protected. If they're broken, we can't be responsible for that. The second um, part of the upload section is your organizational financial documents. So these are financial documents that um, reflect your entire organization. It should be for your current fiscal year and your most recently completed fiscal year. So these documents should include income and expenses. They should be in the same format for both years, no more than two to three pages each. And you should, you should include notes for anything that you think panelists should have more information about. So for example, if you have big variances, if you had a new funder, if you had a capital campaign, um, if you want to detail those payments to artists, all of that you can include as notes with these financial documents. The next budget information that you will be providing is the expenditure budget. And this is where you will show how you'd spend your NISCA award if you're successful. So there is not a project budget where you're estimating income and expenses and um, asking for a specific amount from NISCA. You don't do that anymore. You are gonna indicate what categories of spending based on the options up here on the slide that you would spend your award on and what percentage of your award you would spend in each category. Then you'll include a note with a little more detail about what each of those expenses would be. The next slide is going to show an example. Of course, this applicant has made sure that their percentages add up to 100%. And then they've provided a few more details about each of the categories. For example, 40% on art, outside artistic fees and services, for this applicant means um, teaching artist fees. Very important to note that if you are allocating any of your NISCA award towards personnel, you can allocate towards up to three different staff positions. And if you are doing this, you need to include specific details in this notes box. The details are the title of the position, the annual salary for that position, the number of hours that person works per week and the number of months that person works per year. If you're successful with your application and you get a grant, you're going to be getting a contract with the state of New York. And this information is going to be translated into dollar amounts on your contract. Mm -hmm. If you are missing the information about salary and you plan to spend some of the NISCA award on salary, we have to follow up with you and it slows down the contracting process. So please make sure that you include each of these details for salary in your expenditure budget. We'll go on to the next slide. Before we go on to the next, I'm getting some notes that, uh, that it froze on public service. So we're just gonna take a moment and just jump back to public service and then we'll go on to evaluation. Is that okay with you, Christine? Sure. Okay, um, just to jump backwards. So there are three narrative sections, creativity, public service and management financial. The second section is public service. It begins with a drop down where you can refer back to that uh, list and statement around underrepresented communities. So you can identify what percentage 
of your total annual audience comes from those historically underrepresented communities, between less than 25%, between 25 and 50%, or more than 50%. Then there's an opportunity within a narrative box to talk generally about your organization's audience. And I think I would talk about this broadly, especially if you have multiple different types of programs. If your organization serves, uh, serves a significant number of people from historically underrepresented communities, you will highlight who specifically within that list you are serving. There's also an opportunity to talk about your cultural programming, as well as your current audience. You should talk about how you are expanding your reach. This is an opportunity to talk about your marketing efforts in order to expand the reach beyond your current audience and who you are uh, reaching out to serve. Uh, there's an opportunity to talk about asking about removing barriers, both physical and economic. I would recommend here that, that in addition to talk about other barriers, if your uh, venues and your programs are ADA accessible, specifically mention that. And if you are working on addressing issues of accessibility uh, around ADA accessibility, please mention that here. Um, and then last but not least, you know, there's an opportunity to tell us about a current alliance or local partnership that is critical to reaching diverse audience. All right, now I think we can jump back to evaluation slide 24. Okay, so once you have submitted your application, it goes through our peer panel review process. This is really the heart of the process. And we take care to select a diverse group of professionals that represent all aspects of whatever discipline panel they're on. They come from all across the state and they have expertise on various aspects of nonprofit management. Uh, we actually still have our nomination process open. So we get a lot of our great panelists from people who nominate themselves or a colleague. So if you're interested or you think this would be a great role for someone you know, please go to that link, um, the panelist link on our website. And it's due really soon, so do it sooner rather than later. But keep in mind that um, we need panelists every year. So if you don't make it this year, keep it in mind um, for next year. And the way that panelists score each proposal is with three criteria. So these are the criteria that um, are reflected in our application narrative. Each panelist gives a score for creativity, a score for public service, and a score for managerial and financial. In this rubric, which you can also find in the application guidelines, um, it articulates the benchmarks that they are looking for when they're referring to each applicant. They are scoring each of these sections on um, a scale of zero to five. So zero would be incomplete, and five would be an applicant that demonstrates that they meet or exceed all of the articulated benchmarks. So remember when you're crafting your narrative, keep that rubric handy, refer to it, and make sure that you're reflecting the things that it outlines. If you have questions as you're putting together your proposal, remember, of course, there's more webinars this week for other categories, and we will be having office hours early in June. Um, but you also have the opportunity to contact our help desk with any technical type questions. So you lost your password or you need some help with pre-qualification, um, send an email to help at arts.ny.gov. And if you have questions about the opportunities, about the content, please contact a program staff member. There's a list of program staff member and um, the discipline areas that they're responsible for. So reach out to someone who is aligned with the disciplines that you engage with in your organization. And keep in mind that as the deadline approaches, we get really, really slammed with questions. So try to reach out with any questions at least two weeks before the application deadline of July 13th. Um, also note, we can't review, we can answer your questions. We can't review a draft or review any material that you plan to submit. So speaking of timeline, um, now is the middle of webinar week. Registration links are live. If you wanna attend some of the webinars that we're holding later in the week, tomorrow is support for artists and it's special opportunities. All these webinars are recorded and going to be posted to the website. 
And as we've said, office hours are going to be in, in June. So those are more informal settings where there are breakout rooms and you'll be able to ask questions and hear colleague questions. And of course you can reach us, uh, the NISCA staff, the program staff, the help desk. And um, one final plug for making sure that you're all set with pre-qualification um, earlier rather than later. Do not wait. So now we're going to launch into some frequently asked questions. All right, we'll just go back and forth. We're gonna start with how to apply for a specific program, theater or music. So Support for Organizations is a single program. It has the same questions, no matter what type of app, what type of organization is applying. Uh, so there's not a specific theater program or music program to apply to. However, there is an opportunity for you to indicate which panel you would like to review your applications, and you can do that through the panel dropdown. There's also a PDF attached there that describes each of the panels if you uh, are curious about which panels are available. Next question, where do I describe the project that I want to spend funds on? You don't. Uh, this application does not have you describe a future project. Remember, it's not project-based funding. The application is backwards facing and you will be describing recent programs from recent years. You don't submit a project budget. You only have the expenditure budget section where you indicate what categories of the award and what percentages of the award you would spend funds on if you are successful. Uh, similarly, where do I enter a request amount? There's not a place for you to enter in a request amount. All applicants will be considered for full funding. That's also true about multi-year. All applicants are being considered for multi-year as well. The total amount of grant funding and whether or not this organization, the, the grant will be a single or a multi-year grant is determined based off of a funding formula that uses the scores that are uh, given by panelists. What are the contract dates for the grant? If you're successful, your contract dates will be January 1st through December 31st, 2024. So all spending has to take place within that time frame. How do I enter personnel information in the use of funds section? That is in the notes section within the use of funds under personnel. You may allocate funding to up to three different positions within your organization. But for any amount that's going to a, a, a job or a personnel, you must indicate the title of the job, the annual salary, and how many weeks, hours per week and months per year that that person's working. That would go directly into the contract. Next question is, can I apply if I am also applying for special opportunities? Yes, if you are eligible to apply in special opportunities and you have a specific program for that, you may also apply in support for organizations. If I am fiscally sponsored or part of a university, yes, you can apply. Remember you apply to your the parent organization or the sponsor organization will be the direct applicant. They're the people that register and pre-qualify, but the information within the application uh, will refer to your organization as a sponsored organization. I know I saw within the uh, within the pre-questions, there's a question about what this, whether or not this applies to SUNY organizations as well. Yes, SUNY organizations are uh, may sponsor. Uh, theaters or other organizations that are housed within them, the same as any other institution of higher learning. Can I apply if I am currently getting multi-year support? No, if you are currently getting multi-year support through support for organizations, you may not apply again this year. If you are not sure if you're getting multi-year support, you can look up your award email and it will tell you if you're on multi-year. Um, please note that our contracts are for one year only. So even if your contract, all your, your contract definitely says it's for one year, um, but if you're not sure, double check that email. It will tell you whether or not you're on multi-year. A new contracts uh, information will be coming out for those multi-years uh, in the next month. All right, if I'm not part of priority category, yes, this is this program is meant to have a, a broad range of funding for a broad range of applications. So even if you don't necessarily uh, you know, see yourself as in one of those priority categories, we encourage you to apply and to answer the questions directly to the best of your ability. Okay, so we're now going to look at some of the questions that have been coming in. And I'm gonna pull up the first one. 
Um, so someone is asking, can I apply for support for organizations and for the capital opportunity in the fall? And the answer is yes. So long as you meet the eligibility requirements, you are welcome to apply for both. Uh, similarly, can an organization apply for support for orgs and sponsor or an organization or art artists? Yes, they can. So you, regardless of whether or not, you, if you are, are doing arts program, you may also still uh, sponsor an organization or to apply. Someone asks, are there any opportunities available to for-profit organizations? And the answer is no. We don't give grants to for-profits either as a direct grantee or as a sponsored entity. Uh, can I apply for an FY24 or NISCA grant and, and a grant from a statewide community regrant partner? No, you have to choose between one or the other. And so this is, a, and this is a, once you apply to support for organizations, you will be ineligible to applying for uh, a statewide community regrant. So you, you must select before you apply which one you're going to go for. Do sponsored organizations have to pre-qualify or just the fiscal sponsor? It is just the fiscal sponsor. So if you are unincorporated or a similar entity that's applying through a sponsor, you don't have to separately pre-qualify. Uh, so it says, uh, do you have to be open to the public to apply because they do not have a fiscal space? You do not need to have a publicly open fiscal space. However, your programming does need to be available to the pro uh, to the public. So as long as you are serving the public and the activities that you are offering are publicly available, you do not need to have a physical location that is open to the public. Is there a penalty for applying to more than one opportunity? No, there's not. So if you are sponsoring an artist and also applying in support for organizations and also applying for a special opportunity because you do one of the things in that bucket, um, there is no penalty for applying to more than one. Um, I will say again that if you're getting multi-year support in support for organizations, you cannot again apply this year. Is there a benefit to requesting general operating support as opposed to project support? So support for organizations is an organizational type grant uh, that we do have some, a limited number of project grants within our special, our uh, targeted opportunities grants, but for within the support for organizations, all applications will be considered as this is to support the work that your organization does. Um, can an FY24 grant be applied to a program that is going to take place in 2020? So maybe I'll repeat the last one in case I got frozen. Um, someone asked if their FY24 grant can be applied to a program that's going to take place in 2024 and 2025. Um, no problem if your programming spans multiple years, but the NISCA funds have to be spent within the year it's designated for. Our contracts are for one year, so if you receive a 2024 grant, it has to be spent that year. It can't be that that those dollars can't be carried into the next year, even if that programming spans multiple years. All right. Can I receive feedback on my previous application ahead of submitting an application this year? Uh, usually, yes, I encourage you to reach out to uh, the program director uh, from your that most closely aligns with your discipline uh, to make sure that you can get uh, feedback from that. Usually, we really encourage people to get that feedback after the application, but we should have some time. I recommend that you, if you don't have feedback yet, to reach out and we'll do our best to accommodate those requests. Okay, we're getting some questions around. Um given that the deadline is mid-July, relating to financial documents, if you have a July, June fiscal year, um, what should you be submitting? So if, if you, um, you, should, you should basically be submitting FY23 and FY22, if that applies to you, give us notes, explain where you are. If you didn't have time to make the most recently completed fiscal year actuals, just tell us it was board approved, or something like that, just explain what it is that you are submitting. Reach out to one of us if you want to talk further about this. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, we are a university with multiple programs. Would we also be eligible to apply for capital funding in the fall? 
So the capital uh, applications are not set until they are published. So I can't speak to any sort of capital, capital eligibility, uh, but you can reach out to capital projects at arts.ny.gov for those questions. Okay. Um, can a nonprofit organization incorporated in New York that hasn't received um, tax federal tax exemption yet apply with a fiscal sponsor? Yes, you can. How much information should we include in the board bios? Would name and title suffice? Generally, yes. I mean, this is an opportunity to talk about, uh, I think, within, within the board itself. However, if they use it, uh, if you want to add some additional details, where I do want to make sure that, that you have is if there are any potential conflict of interest, if you have staff that are serving on the board or familiar relationships, please mark those within your board list document. Someone says their only personnel type expense is a 1099 contractor. Do we list this under salary? No, you don't. So that would be an outside artistic expense or an other outside expense. All right, for returning applicants, how do we determine when our pre-qualification status ends? You need to go to your document vault. Uh, and if you are having problems finding your document vault and finding your expiration date, you can contact help at arts.ny.gov. Okay, I know um, I see a couple questions in the chat that we already got to. Um, I saw someone submitted in advance that they were a literary organization. Do we consider that an arts organization? And yes, absolutely. We support literary publishers, magazines, book publishers, um, literary centers that offer literary um, presenting and programming, such as readings, workshops. We consider literature to be fiction, poetry, um, graphic novels, creative nonfiction, um, literary work in translation from other languages um, and experimental forms as well. If you have further questions, reach out to me. Uh, we've got a good one from the chat. Is that in regards to the 50% of the annual budget, does NISCA have a suggestion for organizations with large variances in budgets due to program? For example, as an ensemble theater company with annual budgets, uh, they can really shift a lot from year to year. Um, so this is a, a good example where I would we have two parts. One is about eligibility, which is the, uh, to be eligible, you must be able to show at least $20,000 in cash expenses in your most recently completed fiscal year. That's kind of a hard and fast eligibility rule. In terms of talking about the size of your organization as it relates to your programming, this is where I would use budget notes, right? So you're uploading your budget document, both from the current fiscal year and your most previously um, uh, requested, you can use whatever format best tells your story within that. And within budget notes, I would mention this might be something we're saying like touring is a huge part of this budget this year, but it you know happens on a three-year cycle or however you want to contextualize those budget numbers, there's your opportunity to do so. Question about can we serve on a panel if we're also applying for funding? Yes, many of our panelists work at grantee organizations. Um, all panelists have to declare their affiliations. And if they are, in, we try to make it so that a panelist isn't serving the day um, an organization that they have an affiliation with is coming up for review, but we can't always prevent all of that. So if that were to happen, they would just recuse themselves from reading or scoring or participating in any discussion of that proposal. So there's not a conflict of interest. We are a multidisciplinary organization, but anticipate allocating most of the NISCO award towards artist fees music, do you recommend that we have a multidisciplinary or music panel evaluator application? So that use of NISCA funds section where you would say this is all going to artist fees, that is not part of the scored criteria of the application. Your narrative is the scored criteria. So when you look at the narrative that you are writing about the work that your organization does, even if you're planning on using NISCA funds for a specific project, this is backwards looking, you're talking about the holistic work of your organization. If the work that your organization does is primarily music, I would generally recommend applying through a NISCA panel, uh, a music panel. However, if this, uh, if your narrative is talking, touching on a broad range of different disciplines and you would prefer to be in the multidisciplinary category, that is an option for you to select. Could work samples include curriculums for artistic workshops as mentioned in the creativity section. Yes, absolutely. You could submit, um, for example, a sample lesson plan, please label it again. So if, as if you were submitting a video, um, this is lesson three from the ceramics workshop for older adults. 
Someone says for the expenditure budget, if we're not fully funded, the BISC is say which parts of the expenditure plan will be covered. Uh, that is why we ask for percentages instead of hard dollar amounts. So uh, you were saying that your 50% is going to go towards uh, towards artist fees. If you are funded for $20,000 or $10,000, that 50% will be taken from that total budget, right? And that will help us build the contract for the year. Um, someone's asking if they need to align their fiscal year with NISCA's contract dates. And no, you don't. The financial documents that you submit are aligned with your own fiscal year. So although our contracts always run January through December, we're asking you for your budget information in your fiscal year. We kind of covered this already, but because I know that it, it comes up a lot, we should do it again. Most of the staff in our organization are contractors and paid hourly. Since you mentioned that we need to list our staff annual salaries, I'm wondering if we're still eligible to use NISCA funding to cover the cost of contractors, or do they need to be on payroll? I would really separate out the narrative section from the use of funds. When you talk about staffing within your narrative section, I would include the work that your contracted staff does for your organization. In the use of funds section, you would just put that work, those contracted staff folks, uh, under the non-artistic contracted personnel, contracting. Uh, and it's an eligible expense, and it's fine to allocate uh, grant funds to that. Are you asking that we abbreviate the three recordings we submit together so they're only 10 minutes long? That's one way you could do it. You could create a video specifically um, for review, but if you're submitting you know, your performance um, that's two hours long, just tell us where you want us to watch. Remember that panelists have about 10 minutes to spend on your support materials and point us to where you would want them to start. Well, this. My organization has had very little programming since of COVID due to industry regulations. How should you approach that? Um, it's a the uh, the narrative application is fairly broad in that it doesn't say within the last fiscal year talk about activities. It just says list three recent activities. So you can uh, I would really choose to talk about your recent activities and programs to what best reflects your organization. And if that has to go before the pandemic, you can do it before the pandemic. That said, because of this, uh, we, we also have had questions about newer organizations, uh, newly formed. It's a backwards looking application. So what I often tell organizations that are uh, kind of in the first few years of their organization is that if they don't feel like they can answer the questions about the communities that they're serving or the activities that they're doing well because they're new, they might need to have a little bit more activities under their belt in order to be competitive. Can funding be applied to our endowment? Um, no, that's not really something that needs to be spent um, on one of the categories that we have in the expenditure budget, whether that is programming or overhead, something that you will be um, expending an expense for this year. Yeah. Um, I'm confused about the percentage side. Are you asking to split up the entire operating budget by percentage and area and you'll decide what to fund? Or are you asking us to list by percentage the areas that we could use the funding? Um, I would recommend the, it's the second. So you imagine that you're getting a $10,000 award. How would you piece that out? Right? You might say, I'm gonna, I would get $5,000 for artist fee, $2,500 for my executive director, and $2,500 for rent. Right? That'd be 50%, 25%, 25%. It does not need to match what your overall budget is. This is just how you would plan to use the grant award that you get. This is what we use to build the contract. You will, you, if you are funded, those fund, those percentages go into the contract and you will sign saying of this money, 50% will be going to artist fees, 25% to our executive director with all the personnel information and 25% to rent. My fiscal year is the calendar year. Do I submit 2023 even if it is incomplete? Yes, you're submitting your current fiscal year's budget. So for you, it would be actuals plus projected. For someone who's July, June, it's going to be basically projected at this point. For you, you're submitting 2023, actual plus projected, and you're submitting 2022, which is complete. All right, more budget questions. Are there certain budget categories that are prioritized? For example, support for artists rather than staffing costs? No. 
Um, the, the use of funds section is not part of the scored criteria. It is to assist us with in, uh, in contracting. So we're not going to do something saying an organization is going to get a higher award because they're going to spend 100% of their grant amount on artists. You should allocate the funds to where they're going to be most helpful to your organization. How can we confirm whether our current grant is a multi-year award? Go back to your award email. It will tell you whether your award is um, year one of two or for a single year or what. Um, if you can't find it, then reach out to the help desk. All right, more budget questions. Can you put the entire expenditure personnel? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, we put together many, multiple contracts last year where 100% of the fee went to their artistic director, for example. Just make sure that you put in the, the salary, the title, and the hours and months worth. Um, someone is asking again, will we be awarding multi-year grants this year? And does the variance in your budget affect multi-year funding? Um, the answer is yes, we will be awarding multi-year grants this year. Again, you don't have to specifically ask for it. Whether or not you receive it um, is uh, um, determined by the funding formula, the panel score for your proposal. Um, so if you're awarded two years of funding, you are guaranteed funding for those two years. Um, your budget is not then revisited. Um, but I would say in cases where an organization is secure enough and receiving scores that are high enough to merit multi-year funding, um, the budget variation probably isn't going to, um, it, it's probably not going to come into a, to play for an organization like that. But bottom line, you do not have to specifically request multi-year um, funding. It is always on the table. It is always under consideration. It is assumed that everyone wants it. Um, good one. Are there certain underrepresented communities that carry more or less weight than others? Um, so I think for any questions similar to this, I would always re uh, refer you to the rubric. This is the exact same. If you're at, if you're wondering how we uh, tell uh, the guidance that we give to panelists on how to evaluate applications, we give them this exact same rubric. And there's nothing within this rubric saying that certain underrepresented communities should be scored better or worse than others. We give them this rubric, and then they score based off of that. For operating budgets, does this need to be all cash for the minimum budget requirement, or you, could you consider in-kind salaries for the minimum budget requirement? No, we can't consider in-kind um, income and expenses as um, a way to meet the minimum budget requirement. Remember that if you are under an operating budget of $20,000, there are other options for you through our various re-grant opportunities. Um, so you should definitely consider availing yourself of one of those. What are the big differences between last year's support for organizations application this year? Uh, very little has changed. The major ones are that we have a new mission value statement uh, that you can refer to. Uh, we've added several additional questions for sponsored organizations to get some more context. Uh, the grant amounts range for all applications from $10,000 to $49,500 and a return to NISCA's pre-pandemic policy of funding a limited percentage of an organization's annual budget, in this case, 50%. Is a financial audit required to submit? Um, it depends on your organization's size. If you are over a certain size, then it is required to be submitted as part of um, your pre-qualification vault. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to our help desk. Will this webinar be posted online? Yes, all the webinars for Webinar Week will be published online. Uh, I think we'll, it take, might take a few days, but we'll get everything online. Is there a typical length of time for multi-year awards? Typically it's two or three years. Oh, okay. the, sorry, go ahead, David. No, no, sorry. Uh, if we are university applying on behalf of a semi-autonomous arts program under the university umbrella, do we submit the financial statements of the university as a whole or the semi-autonomous arts program? So there's kind of two parts to this. One is that your organization will need to answer the registration questions are for the university. 
and the pre-qualifications for the university. Uh, when it comes time for the budget documents and the, all the narrative questions, the financial statements, those should be for the semi-autonomous organization. So if you're saying, here's this theater, you would have the profit and loss statement uh, and uh, for that specific organization. Does NISCA still require that organizations have one full-time staff? No, that is not a requirement. Can I start my application today? Uh, no, but tomorrow you can. So you can you can definitely read through the application gui uh, guidelines today and start formulating your questions. I do recommend often uh, drafting your responses in a word processing uh, document before cutting and pasting them into the, uh, the online server just in case you lose them. But the portal will open is on track to open tomorrow. All right, we are going to uh, wind down this webinar soon. Um, you can always reach out to one of us. I'm going to take uh, one last question. Um, as a book publisher and not a programmer, it's difficult to quantify or qualify our readership. We aim for a diverse, inclusive readership, but don't have direct information on who buys or borrows our books. How do we handle questions that ask for this info? So this relates to the registration info where we ask for audience numbers, virtual and in-person. So I say, use the notes box. Give us the information, whatever you do track, number of sales, subscribers, things like that, number of people who have attended your readings and events. Um, input that, give us notes on what that is. Um, if you want to Give more information in the um, public service section on audience. You can give, you know, some of the widely circulated figures like each book that's published gets read or picked up by, you know, two or three or four people. I don't remember what the, the current one is, but just any information that can contextualize um, the figures that you do have is going to help us better understand your organization and how you are measuring your audience numbers. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing I will also give a plug for is, um, you know, if your question didn't get answered today, you can uh, either reach out to the help desk, you can reach out to a staff member from our staff page, or I really recommend uh, coming to one of our open office hours, which is a chance to have a dialogue with the staff person to get your questions answered in real time. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are looking forward to reading your proposals, and please be in touch. So thank you so much, Christine and David. That concludes today's webinar. A reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the NISCA website along with the presentation deck. Thank you all so much for your patience through our technical difficulties today. Uh, a reminder that tomorrow's webinar is for our Support for Artists opportunity and will start at 11 a.m. There is still time to register. Our office hour schedule and registration links will be shared this coming Friday. Please check the NISCA website for the full schedule and registration links. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's wonderful to share this virtual space with you.